Palm Sunday, Psalm Sunday, Qualm Sunday. Luke 19, 28 to 44. Palm Sunday, Psalm Sunday, Qualm Sunday. For some, it's a season of gladness. For others, a reason for sadness. It's a time of celebration, of salvation, but it's also of trepidation for condemnation. It all depends on one's response to the righteous Redeemer who rides into Jerusalem to reconcile and rectify. Let's just jump right into our text for tonight. Starting at Luke 19.28, it says, Then, after he said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Luke 19.28 Now, as we said, you always had to go up to Jerusalem since Jerusalem was on a hill. But what are these things that Jesus has just said? Well, in Luke 19, 12 27, Jesus has just told a parable where a nobleman gives ten servants ten minas. A mina was apparently equivalent to three months' wages. And the servants are to use the money they've been given in order to make a profit. Then the man goes away for a while to have himself appointed as king. But the servants actually send messengers after him to say, We don't want this man to be king. Nonetheless, the man is appointed as king, and when he comes back, he rewards the servants who manage his money well. But in Luke 19.27, the king in the parable says, But those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Luke 19.27 Now, it's important not to take every detail of the parable as an exact representation of how Christ will conduct himself when he consummates the kingdom of God, the day when Jesus judges, on Judgment Day. But suffice it to say that it will not go well for those who don't want to acknowledge Christ as king. Brothers and sisters, as it's been said, in our lives, have we let Christ have his crown? He will reign forever and evermore. But right now, does he reign in our hearts? Is he the master of our minds? Is he the sovereign of our souls? Is he the Lord of our lives? Well, whether or not people recognize, Christ comes into Jerusalem as king. And this is how it happened. Luke 19, 29 and 31, it says, And it came to pass, as he came near Bethpage and Bethany, to the mountain called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, in which, when you enter, you will find a colt that has been tied up, a colt which no person has ever sat upon. Untie it, luo is the verb here in Greek, untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks, why are you untying it? Respond in this way, the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. Luke 19, 29 to 31. Now, this location is important because in Zechariah 14, the prophet foretells that the Messiah would appear on the Mount of Olives. And we'll read an important passage from Zechariah later on. Also, it was common to send messengers out in pairs, but it doesn't say which two disciples were on donkey duty. And its word translated cult refers to a young donkey. Now, as I said before, If you look at Pastor's Palm Sunday sermon from 2021, at the 35-minute, 6-second mark, and at the 36-minute, 18-second mark, he says this word I'm about to say. And since Pastor said it twice, I hope I won't ruffle too many feathers when I say it. So Jesus tells the disciples that they are going to find an ass that was tied up. And this young donkey was the animal that King Jesus was going to ride on, making for a glorious entrance. Now, is there anything in your life that the Lord can use for His glory, but it's tied up? Is your schedule too tied up to serve Him? Are your eyes too tied up with the bad news that you can't read the good news? Are your lips too tied up spreading gossip that you can't spread the gospel? Is your mind too tied up with secular education that you have no time for spiritual dedication? Are your talents too tied up chasing plastic trophies and man-made medals that you can't strive for the Christian crown of righteousness? 
too tied up with selfish ambition to be part of the Son of Man's mission? Do you have anything that can be used for the king? Any possession that can be used for profession? Whatever it is, metaphorically, to be used for his glory, Jesus can set your ass free. In any case, for the Savior's service, the Lord gives the disciples authority to loose this donkey. And this is similar language to what we find earlier in Luke 13, where Jesus heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath and says, Woman, thou art loosed. See Luke 13, 12. Now, the synagogue leader wasn't too happy about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. You were not supposed to do any work on the seventh day. So he's like, Jesus, there's six other days of the week that you can heal. Just don't do it on the Sabbath. But in Luke 13, 15 and 16, it says, The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose, luo, the same word, loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to watering? Verse 16, And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed, luo, from this bond on the Sabbath day. Luke 13, 15, 16. How many know that Jesus can break every chain? Every chain. Jesus loosed this woman who had been crippled and bent over for eighteen years, and she sang Christ's praises. And the disciples are to loose this donkey, and people will sing Christ's praises. That said, no one had ever sat upon or ridden this donkey. Now, if you buy a new car, as soon as you drive it off the lot, what happens to its value? It depreciates. It goes down. If you bought it for $20,000 and you want to sell it soon after that, it'll have to be less than $20,000. And apparently some car models can lose over 40% of their value in the first year. So even in our society, a ride that has never really been driven before inherently has more value. A new car has more value. People are willing to pay more for a new car that no one else has ever owned. Now used cars aren't worth as much. Now they're cool with me. All the cars I've ever owned have been used. And up until recently, they've all been teenagers. And you know, teenagers can be a bit stubborn. So my cars didn't always listen when I told them to go. From time to time, they would even throw tantrums on the side of the road. Used cars aren't worth as much, and sometimes they're not worth the trouble. But they're cool with me. But when it comes to Christ the King, he deserves a pure cult. No one else has ever rode the Redeemer's ride. In addition, in the Old Testament, at times, animals that had never been ridden or worked before were required for a pure sacrifice. See Numbers 19.2 and Deuteronomy 21.3. Such animals that had never been ridden before were required for a pure sacrifice or to bring the Ark of the Old Covenant to another place. See 1 Samuel 6.7. Well, here in the New Testament, Jesus rides an animal that had never been ridden or worked before to the place where he would bring about the new covenant through his pure sacrifice. Now, in Greek, as we'll see later, the word translated Lord, kurios, can merely mean master or owner. But it can also refer to the Lord, meaning the Lord God. Christ tells the disciples to say, the Lord needs it. And the Lord in this instance could have either meaning. But we know that Jesus is Lord. Let me bless his holy name. In Luke 19, 32 to 34, it says, Then after they departed, those who were sent found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, as they were untying the colt, its owners, or literally their lords, said to them, Why are you untying the colt? So they said, the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. Luke 19, 32 to 34. Now, as you said, 
The word that was translated Lord earlier can also mean master or owner. And here the owners or lords of the cult ask the disciples what they're doing. Now, a couple of years ago, I went to a club in Philadelphia. I saw some friends I hadn't seen in a while. I danced a little, you know, cut little rug. Then, when the party was over, I started walking to the car. And the club didn't have a parking lot, so, you know, I had to park on the street. But when I went to the street where I parked, my car wasn't there. And I was like, I could have swore I put my car right here. But then it slowly dawned on me, someone had taken my ride. And sometime after I reported stolen, the police told me that the car had been recovered. My dad and I went to see what was left of it, and turns out it wasn't much. They cleaned out almost everything. Almost everything. My DJ equipment, my gym bag, even the coins in the seat cushions. I think they might have left a few pennies for me, but that was it. Quick question. Anyone else ever had to pay for gas in quarters? How about dimes? Nickels? Just me? In any case, if I saw the guys who took my ride while they were taking my ride, and they said, the Lord needs it, should I have believed them? Would you have believed them? Nah, man, the Lord knows I need my ride. But maybe the Lord knew that I needed to stop going to clubs in Philly. When they cleaned me out, I cleaned up my act, at least for a little while. I lived a club-free life for at least a good six months. Didn't have any more DJ speakers to earn cash. Didn't have any more coins for gas. And didn't have no more ride. And they tore up the ignition. They tore up the ignition, so that was the last time anyone rode in that car, ever. But here, this cult had never been ridden by anyone. A pure cult for the pure king, who came to establish the new covenant through his pure sacrifice. In a sense, the disciples took the cult's owner's ride, for the Lord needed it. Now, it's possible that Jesus is demanding this donkey, like a Roman official might demand the temporary service of someone's animal for royal purposes. That said, back then, animals like this donkey were kept for travelers to borrow or to rent. You know, like when you arrive at the airport, they usually have rental cars available. However, back in the day, especially since most people were usually poor, it was common, if not expected, for people to show hospitality to strangers and visitors. And how much more should they do so for the Savior of the world? Especially if the cult's owners were aware of the prominence of the Prince of Peace, they might count it a privilege to lend their cult to the Christ. Now, how many of us would let Jesus borrow our car? Would you charge him? I would have to clean up my car a little bit first, but... It will be my pleasure to lend it to him for free. And I know when he's done with it, he's going to fill up the tank. My tank overfloweth. Fill it up, God. Fill it up. But seriously, it would be an honor and a privilege for Jesus to use your ride. I mean, could you imagine how the owners of the cult must have felt after Palm Sunday? They might have told everyone, hey, did you know that Jesus rode into Jerusalem driving my donkey? If a celebrity signs a piece of paper, it instantly becomes more valuable, right? And wouldn't people pay a lot for the baseball from a World Series winning home run? Wouldn't people pay a lot for the football from a famous quarterback's last touchdown pass? Such things are worth a lot because people worship celebrities. But we are to worship the Savior. And just imagine how much the cult that carried Christ the King would be worth. If this happened today, you know that cult would be on eBay in a minute. And I know if Jesus rode my car, I'd be selling every part of it. I would auction the Savior's seatbelt, the car door of the deliverer, you name it. I'd be like, Jesus took this wheel, and I will take money for it. It would be worth a lot. It would be an honor and a privilege for Jesus to consider one's ride to be worthy. That said, I don't think I would consider my ride to be worthy of Jesus. Lord knows I ain't perfect, but I know I serve a perfect Lord. And I just want to talk a little bit about his perfect word. 
For Palm Sunday, it was a pure cult for the pure king who came to establish the new covenant through his pure sacrifice. Now, it's possible that Jesus had already made arrangements with the cult's owners in advance. But we also know that Jesus has divine foresight. However it happened, we know this was all a part of the master's master plan. Then in Luke 19, 35 to 36, it says, Then they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and had Jesus mount it. And as he went along, people were spreading their cloaks on the road. Luke 19, 35 to 36. Now, spreading cloaks on the road was a sign of respect to someone of superior rank. And this gesture actually recalls what happens to an earlier king. See, back in 2 Kings 9, see 2 Kings 9, 1 to 13, Elisha sends a prophet to anoint a commander named Yehu as king of Israel. And in case the other members of the army wouldn't approve, Elisha tells the prophet to anoint him in private, proclaim him to be king according to the word of the Lord, and then run away. We all know some people will try to shoot the messenger. So after he delivers the message, the messenger flees on foot. In any case, when Yehu gets the message, he tries to play it cool. The other officers of the army ask him what happened, and he's like, oh, you know that prophet, he'd just be saying things. But in 2 Kings 9, 12-13, it says, that's not true, they said. Tell us. Yehu said, here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Verse 13. They quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Yehu is king. 2 Kings 9, 12-13. So you see, spreading cloaks under someone was an act of respect and reverence for royalty. For King Yehu and King Yeshua, that is King Jesus, people roll out the red carpet. And Christ's choice of transportation is important for a few reasons. For one, donkeys were used for civil processions, not for military purposes. Though many expected the Jewish Messiah to be a conqueror who would overthrow their Roman oppressors, Christ comes riding not on a war horse, but a humble colt. On a humble colt, the foal of a donkey. Also, riding on a lowly young animal recalls some important Old Testament passages. For example, in Genesis 49, 9-11, Jacob prophesies that the Messianic king, the line of Judah, will tie his donkey to a vine, his colt to a choicest branch. Also in 1 Kings 1, 32-40, when Solomon succeeds his father David, King David, he rides on a lowly mule and is anointed as king. Furthermore, though Luke does not cite it explicitly like Matthew and John, this is clearly a prophetic fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. 9. And if we keep reading in Zechariah 9.10 about the Messianic king, the Lord says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. He will proclaim peace to the nations. That's Zechariah 9.10. On Palm Sunday, Jesus is publicly putting the people on notice. He fulfills the scriptures riding into Jerusalem on a colt of a donkey as the Messianic king who will bring peace and salvation with his worldwide rule. Some people recognize, some people don't. What about us? Then in Luke 19, 37 to 38, it says, As he was coming near, already close to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples, rejoicing, began to praise God in a loud voice for all of the miracles that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Luke 19, 37-38.
Now, the whole multitude of disciples refers to a much broader circle than just the twelve. And the word translated miracles refers more literally to mighty deeds of power, mighty works. And suffice it to say that these disciples have seen Jesus do great things. With their own eyes, they have likely witnessed Christ's healings and cleansings and exorcisms. They've likely seen greater things than we ever have. Yet how many of us know that he has done great things? He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Bless is the one who comes. Now when Jewish travelers arrived to the holy city from out of town, it was common to greet them with shouts of jubilation. You know, after a long journey to Jerusalem, it was likely nice to be received by a sort of welcoming committee. But the Redeemer's reception goes beyond the norm. More literally, the people shout, Blessed is the one who comes, the King, in the name of the Lord. And the one who comes, or the coming one, is really more of a title, as you'll see throughout Luke. Christ the King has many great titles because he's done many great things. And you see, brothers and sisters, my fellow Christians, we bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But while we use the name of the Lord for blessing, the world uses the name of the Lord for cursing. Ever notice how Hollywood loves to take our Lord's name in vain? They use Jesus like it's an expletive. Something goes wrong and they're like, Jesus, man, that was crazy. Or they'll say, for Christ's sake, knock it off. Things like that. They need to put some respect on the name of Jesus. Yet they proclaim the name with plain disdain. They treat the God of grace with disgrace, being rude to our rock and our redeemer, the rock of ages, the rock of our salvation. Metaphorically, they'll get on stage and slap the rock in the face. In any case, we should bless the name of the Lord. We should bless the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And these disciples aren't just joyfully shouting to Jesus. They're singing to the Savior. You see, this ain't just Palm Sunday. It's a Psalm Sunday. They're singing lyrics from Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 is likely a song about a king in the line of David who goes to the temple after returning from victory on the battlefield. Later, Psalm 118 becomes a part of a group of psalms called the Hallel. And the Hallel Psalms, so Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, were typically sung in corporate worship during the Feast of Tabernacles and also during the Passover. And as we studied before, the Lord is our Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Also see 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And since the Passover is only days away, these psalm lyrics would likely be on the tip of everyone's tongue. And truth be told, we often have Psalm 118 on our tongues as well. Starting at verse 22, it says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. You know, we often say, This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. See the King James Version. And of course, God has made every day. Every single day is the day the Lord has made in a certain sense. But Psalm 118 is not talking about just any day. Psalm 118 is talking about the day the Lord made when the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And you see in the next chapter, Luke 20, 9 to 19, Jesus quotes Psalm 118 in the parable of the wicked tenants. In the parable, a man plants a vineyard, rents it out to some tenant farmers, and then goes away for a while. Later, when it's time for the harvest, when the rent's due, the owner sends a servant to collect his cut. But what do the tenants do? They beat the servant and send him away with nothing. Then the owner sends another servant and another servant. But they get beat up and thrown out as well. Now what's the owner to do? Well, he decides to send his beloved son. Surely, they will respect the vineyard owner's son, right? But no, 
the tenants decide to kill the son and try to claim his inheritance. So what now? In Luke 20, 16 and 17, it says, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Verse 17, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's quoting Psalm 118, 22. And that's Luke 20, 16 to 17. Now, what does this all mean? Well, as we discussed in previous lessons, Israel was often metaphorically portrayed as God's vine or vineyard. God is the owner of this vineyard, and he appointed rulers or tenants to take care of his vine. But when the Lord sends his servants, that is the Old Testament prophets, to the tenants, they were often beaten, persecuted, and or killed. So God decides to send his beloved son, Jesus, the Son of God. But the tenants, the Israelites' rulers, they will kill him too. Yet the rejected stone becomes the cornerstone. That is, though the builders of the temple in Jerusalem had rejected Jesus, Jesus becomes the cornerstone of the new, true temple of God. You see, the church individually and collectively is the temple of God. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. The body is a temple. And Christ is the cornerstone of the temple. And according to Christ, the day the rejected stone becomes the cornerstone, that is, when Jesus was rejected by the leaders of the temple and became the cornerstone of the church, that was truly the day the Lord made over 2,000 years ago. Though being God's vineyard or vine was previously only a privilege for Israel, all who were faithful and fruitful in Christ become members of the new vineyard. Recall that in John 15, Jesus says to his disciples, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. And Christ, the true vine, is also the true king. So the disciples remix Psalm 118 as they bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, 25 to 27 says, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Psalm 118, 25 to 27. Now, the word translated boughs can refer to branches or foliage that has been twisted together. And in Matthew's account of Palm Sunday, in chapter 21, verse 8, it says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Matthew 21, 8. John also mentions palms in his account. See John 12, 13. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. But maybe Luke, who was likely writing to Gentiles, omits this detail since palms were really significant symbols for the Jewish nation. In fact, after the great Jewish leader Simon Maccabeus defeats the Syrians and retakes Jerusalem in the 2nd century BC, when he enters Jerusalem, there is also singing and praising with palms. Palms were nationalistic symbols for Jewish pride. That being said, Palm Sunday is also a Psalm Sunday. When singing to the Savior, the disciples add the word king to Psalm 118, 26. They say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they also sing about peace in heaven. This is likely a paraphrase for the Hebrew term Hosanna. Hosanna means save or save now, save please. And Hosanna eventually became an expression of praise. And they also sing glory in the highest. That is glory in the highest heavens. What the people proclaim is actually similar to what the angels announce earlier in Luke on the first Christmas. After telling the shepherds that the Savior, the Messianic King, had been born, in Luke 2, 13 and 14, it says, And all of a sudden, with the angel, there was a large number of the army of heaven praising God and saying, Glory in the highest heaven. Glory in the highest to God. And on earth, peace among people he favors. Luke 2, 13, 14. Now, I know we are familiar with the phrase, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. 
But as we said in our previous Christmas lessons, that's not the most accurate rendering of that verse. It's really about true peace for those with whom God is pleased or upon whom he favors, as you'll see in most modern translations. In any case, as the song goes, Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Another song says, Joy to the world, the Lord has come, Let earth receive her King, Let every heart prepare him room, Let heaven and nature sing, Let heaven and nature sing. Brothers and sisters, in Luke 2, and in Luke 2.19, heaven and nature are basically singing the same song, Glory in the Highest. And we too should sing the same song on Palm Sunday, Psalm Sunday. But of course, not everyone is a fan of all the singing and shouting. Then in Luke 19.39-40, it says, Then some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these disciples keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. Luke 19, 39 to 40. Now, Jesus could be referring to any stones. If Christ can cause the seas to be silent, I'm sure he can make the stones sing some rock music. Moreover, in Isaiah 55, 12, in joyful response to God's salvation, the prophet says to the people, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Luke 55, verse 12. We know the Lord can make heaven and nature sing. But maybe nature would not be singing songs of jubilation, but shouting words of condemnation. In Habakkuk 2, 10 to 11, when the prophet announces judgment against Babylon, it says, You have plotted the ruin of many peoples shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Once again, the stones of the wall, the stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Habakkuk 2, 10 to 11. And considering what we've already read about stones, Christ the cornerstone could be talking about the stones of the temple. And we're going to read some more about stones and the judgment of the temple later. Now, it's possible that the Pharisees just want to keep peace and not arouse the wrath of Rome. But most likely, most of the Pharisees aren't too crazy about these claims of Christ's kingship. But notice how the disciples are singing psalms while the Pharisees want them to keep calm. You know, frankly, the reason why many people aren't too delighted about Jesus is because they're not true disciples of Jesus. If one doesn't really get riled up reading about the one who brings redemption, maybe one doesn't really belong to the Redeemer. If one doesn't really like listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd, maybe one isn't really a good sheep. And as we'll see, those who ain't really happy about the coming of Christ, Christ ain't really too happy with them. Now, we've seen how Palm Sunday is really a Psalm Sunday, but unfortunately, it's also a Qualm Sunday. Some have no qualms about celebrating the Savior, but perhaps those who keep calm should have a qualm about the coming King. Those who don't acknowledge Christ should feel some apprehension. For apparently on Palm Sunday, there is both celebration and sadness. While others sing psalms, at least one weeps. Speaking of songs, ever hear that song that says, It's my party, I can cry if I want to? First recorded in the 60s, the singer laments that, though it's her party, the one she loves doesn't love her back. And how about that song that says, It's so good, it's good, loving somebody, when somebody loves you back. But though Jesus loves everyone, not everyone loves him back. And in that 60s song, the singer cries at her party because the one she loves is actually wearing someone else's ring, walking with him like a queen and a king. Now, could you imagine being the king and creator of the universe 
and your creatures and your bride would rather be in a relationship with someone else. You know anyone that's quote unquote married to the money? You know anyone more committed to their career than to Christ? Driven by their dreams instead of devoted to their deliverer? You know anyone who won't give the Redeemer their hand because they're too busy holding that remote? Would rather spend more time with games than with God? Always got their cell phone in their hand but won't call on Jesus? How would you feel if it's a celebration in your honor, yet the one you love won't love you back? It's his party, and he'll cry if he wants to. In Luke 19, 41 to 42, it says, And as he came near and saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, on this day, had only recognized the things that make for peace, but now it has been hidden from your eyes. Luke 19, 41 to 42. On Palm Sunday, though the people sing psalms, the Savior sobs. It's a day of celebration and sadness. Psalm Sunday, Palm Sunday. In Luke 15, Jesus says that there is rejoicing in the presence of God and angels over one sinner who repents. But Jesus weeps for Jerusalem, which will not. And while some of us are joyful on Palm Sunday, I'm afraid Jesus weeps over many who are not. Now, when Jesus says, even you, this could refer not only to the city of Jerusalem, but at least to some of the people who had been singing his praises. The disciples' praise likely influences the crowd, the crowds that are mentioned in the other Gospels. The fickle crowds join in the celebration, shouting, Hosanna! But many in that same crowd likely turned on Jesus a few days later, shouting, Crucify! We, even we, might be praising the Lord today, but will we be singing that same tune in the days to come? When we find out that Jesus doesn't jive with all of our expectations, when we read that the course of Christ is contrary to the wicked ways of the world, will we still be a faithful follower or a fair-weather fan? Can the blessed Savior count on us? In any case, Christ came to bring salvation, but Jerusalem didn't recognize. And the people have only themselves to blame for their blindness. As you said, people may have physical eyesight, yet lack spiritual insight. Christ comes on a young donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, but the people miss the metaphor. So like the Old Testament servants sent to the vineyard of Israel, Jesus responds with a prophetic lament. Like Jeremiah, the so-called weeping prophet, Christ cries over Jerusalem's sin and doom. For Jerusalem, time is almost up. All right, our last two verses for tonight. In Luke 19, 43 to 44, he says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and encircle you and close in on you from every side, and they will dash you to the ground, you and your children in you, and they will not leave a stone upon a stone in you, because you do not recognize, because you do not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Luke 19, 43 to 44. Now this phrase, the days will come, was often used by Old Testament prophets, often when foretelling of coming judgment. And Jesus foretells of the invasion and destruction of Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, in Jerusalem, Christ says, if the disciples keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And then he prophesies that one day, in Jerusalem, not one stone will be left upon another. In other words, using hyperbole, an exaggeration to make a point. Jesus says that the city will be completely destroyed. Metaphorically speaking, no building will be left standing, not even the stones of the temple. 
as it's been said, this is a prophetic oracle of doom. And Christ's prophecy came to pass about 40 years later, after a Jewish uprising and war from AD 66 to AD 70. Jerusalem was utterly destroyed by Emperor Titus and the Romans in AD 70. When they invaded, the Romans built walls and barricades around the city to prevent Jews from escaping or counterattacking. And the siege of Jerusalem lasted three years, three years of being barricaded and invaded by the imperial oppressors. As you can imagine, the barricades caused supply chain issues. So many died from famine. Others died at the hands of the other Jews in the city who were desperate for survival. And thousands upon thousands were taken captive or killed when the Romans breached the walls of Jerusalem. And with the exception of a few towers the Romans later used for military purposes and part of the West Wall, with the exception of that, the city was razed to the ground. Not a stone was laid upon a stone. And why did all this happen? Jesus says it's because they did not recognize the time of their visitation from God. They did not acknowledge the Messianic King who came to bring true peace. That is peace between God and mankind. Vertical peace. A reconciled relationship with the Father that had been broken due to sin. The Lord graced them with his presence. As you said, the greatest of all presents is the Lord's presence. That said, even when God visits in the Old Testament, it can refer to deliverance or to doom. And the Lord's visit meant grace and peace, yet also judgment and destruction. Christ graciously comes to bring salvation, and those who do not recognize will face condemnation. Now imagine that people are in the middle of the ocean, and they can't swim and they're struggling to stay afloat. Then, imagine that someone comes along with a lifeboat, and they graciously offer to pull people on board. All who want to come aboard will be saved from the waves. Well, ain't that good news? Well, it's good news to those who recognize that salvation has come. It's good news to those who faithfully respond to the captain's gracious offer to save. But for those who turn a blind eye to the lifeboat, to those who fail to recognize that they can be saved, to those who insist on trying to tread water themselves, they are doomed to drown. Now ain't that bad news? Brothers and sisters, you see, I was sinking, deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Because it was love. Love lifted me. When I was sinking in the sinful seas, love lifted me. When I was drowning in the depths of destruction, love lifted me. From the waves and waters of wickedness, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Jerusalem didn't recognize the salvation that came from the Lord's love. The people didn't realize who had come to visit out of love. Love, this was something exciting and new. People just needed to come aboard Christ's lifeboat. He's expecting you. It wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. It was love. Could you imagine Jesus saying to Jerusalem, Oh, if only you knew how much I do, do love you? You ever try to help someone you love, but they just refuse to be helped? You try to help someone whose life is going off track, but they want to keep going the same direction to destruction? Anyone ever been there? It can break your heart. And it breaks Christ's heart as well. You would cry too if it happened to you. Christ came to visit for a rescue mission, but many people don't want to be rescued. 
so they will perish, sinking in the depths of sin. But let me try to throw somebody a lifeline, a line from the life-giving words of the one who gives life. John 3.16 says, For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one-of-a-kind son, so that all who are continually faithful to him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 Brothers and sisters, God came for a visit. The question is, will we recognize that salvation has come? Or will we fail to acknowledge the Savior and therefore not be saved? Now, you ever have company come over to your house? What do you usually do before they come? You clean the house. When I was growing up, my parents made us clean the whole house. And I'd be like, why I got to clean my room? Nobody's going to be in my room. And they'd be like, boy, you ain't got no room. I was living there by grace, unmerited favor. My mom would come in my room like, what's this? What's this? That's all the evidence she ever needed. She knew I didn't use any of that dusting spray, that furniture polish, that pledge. We had company coming for a visit, and I had no pledge. Brothers and sisters, on Palm Sunday, Jerusalem had special company coming for a visit, but most had no pledge. You see, when the king comes to town, you better pledge to the crown. But instead of pledging allegiance, they failed to recognize the prophesied Messianic king who would ride into Jerusalem on a colt of a donkey, a pure colt for the pure king who came to establish a new covenant through his pure sacrifice. They failed to be loyal to the royal who would bring true peace and salvation in his worldwide kingdom. So they faced judgment. Palm Sunday is a Psalm Sunday and a Qualm Sunday. For some, it's a season of gladness. For others, it's a reason for sadness. It's a time of celebration of salvation, but also trepidation for condemnation. Given what we read about Palm Sunday, all are challenged to make a choice. Will we be like the Pharisees or like Christ's followers? Will we be like the people of Jerusalem or the disciples of Jesus? Will we reject or will we rejoice? Will you follow Christ a cornerstone and have joy? Or will we slap the rock in the face and be judged? Even the rocks know the right answer. Some bless the name of Christ, the Lord. Some use it for obscenity. Let's not disrespect the Savior. Let's not treat him like an enemy. For our relationship with God, the Redeemer is the remedy. So recognize the King. Acknowledge his identity. This is Palm Sunday, not a Keep Calm Sunday should be no qualms about singing Psalms Sunday. We praise the Prince of Peace, and we'll all meet him one day. Yet to live with him in heaven, there's truly only one way. May the Lord bless you and keep you.